Well, thank you for your time, Jeff, and welcome to Action Reloaded. Um, the first question I'm going to ask you is the one you've probably asked many times a day. So how did you first discover Kampo and what drew you to this martial art specifically? Yeah, good question. I was um, attending the university in those years, and that's when I met Lou Angel, Hanchi Lou Angel, who's teaching Japanese Gojuru. And so that was when I began my martial art training in 1978. And uh, then when I graduated from college, uh, he said, look, if you want to make martial arts your life, you should move to California and study Kempo from Ed Parker because he's really the best in the world. And back in the days of the early 60s, late 50s, there were very, very few martial arts schools in the United States. And so those very few guys, they all knew each other. And so Mr. Angel was able to write me a letter of recommendation to uh, Ed Parker to switch over and to start studying Kempo. So I sold my car to pay for the moving van and I went to stay with some friends out there. And um, a few a, a week later, after I arrived, was the big Ed Parker uh, International Karate Championships, the IKC. So I thought, great, you know, that'd be the great place to meet him. So I had my letter of recommendation. I went down to Long Beach, California in the summer of 1983. I found Ed Parker. I bowed to him and handed him this letter. And he was so thrilled to hear from his old friend, Lou Angel. He gave me his personal home phone number. He said, give me a couple of weeks to get done with this and call me and I'll get you started. And that was my, so I moved to California to study Kempo and I got to Ed Parker because of Lou Angel. That's amazing. So it was just sort of like pay it forward, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, very much. No, I've, I've been really, really incredibly fortunate to be able to train with two of the best martial artists in the world of our lifetimes. Uh, both of them have transitioned to the other side now, of course. But, um, but, but it was my great fortune to be able to be exposed to both of those gentlemen. Um, what would set Kempo apart from other martial arts styles, like in terms of like techniques, principles, and philosophies? Yep, great question. Gigantic answer. So hold on. <laughs> but it's a completely unique system of all systems of martial arts in the world today and probably for many days to come. And that is because it's based strictly on science and physics and principles and application. And it it holds um, respect where it's due for tradition, very, very much so. But you only take forward what is applicable today. So that was the, the motive of Ed Parker. And so he was the one that took these ancient fighting Chinese techniques and broke them down and redeveloped them in in their physics and their principles and their application and then began what be, later became known as american kempo which was the americanization of the ancient art of kempo is a japanese word Quan fa is the chinese word for kenpo so it started in china long long before Japanese martial arts and moved from China somewhere around 1200 years ago to Okinawa first. And when, and that was because the tea trade came from China to Japan. And so came the families with money and so came their bodyguards. And that's how martial arts made it from China to Japan, starting in Okinawa and then moved through. From uh, Japan, it then went to Hawaii which is where Ed Parker started to learn it. And then in 1954, he was the one that brought it from Hawaii to the mainland United States. So it's made quite the journey, hasn't it? From yes, yes. the depths of Asia over to the Western culture. Right, right. Big transition. But see, in, in my opinion, this is why when, when I refer to Ed Parker, I call him the Einstein of martial arts because he was the one who was so brilliant that he could figure out how to, you know, when, when a whole group of people look at something, but there's one person that sees something that no one else sees, 
That's what makes them brilliant. That's what makes them a genius. And that's what he did. Now, we have taken it further with this fifth evolution of Kempo. We call Kempo 5.0. Yes, that's true. And we've taken the physics and the principles even further. But we did not create them because he was the creator of that kind of thinking. That's why he deserves the credit of being the true innovator of American Kempo, of Kempo, and that's who we look to for Kempo 5.0, of course. So would you say that the martial art of Kempo would be very effective and practical in terms of self-defense? Yes, I, I think this is that the really, the part that makes it stand alone on its own is because of its origin of the science and physics of motion and the geometry of impact that's what makes it so applicable now we are the ones that took that and we're the ones that brought kempo to the ground so we took those very same principles and concepts that he used brilliantly for stand-up defense and we're the ones that then learned Brazilian jiu-jitsu mma and incorporated that into the system so there really was no ground fighting in Kempo before we did what we did. But it was also, and this is really important, the mandate directly from Ed Parker that Kempo should continue to evolve and change so it won't become obsolete. That was his mandate to all of his black belts. So we took that seriously and understood that once the Gracie family in 91 came to the United States and then the Machado family that, that just turned the whole martial art world upside down. You would be hard pressed to find somebody more grateful for that, for the Gracie and Machado family to do what they did than, than me or us, my group, because that's the catalyst that caused us to evolve and change the art, which now we have franchise schools in 21 countries and we're the largest Kempo organization in history. And it's, it's because of the evolution. How would you say that the Kempo has evolved and adapted like over time within the martial arts community? Each one of the Ed Parker black belts had access to him and the brilliance of who he was. Then it's up to us to take it forward. So different black belts have had different uh, versions, if you will, different emphasis of different areas of Kempo. We are really the only ones that decided to make Kempo work on the ground, which has made us very, very unique. That's the good news. The bad news is, in order for us to be successful at that, we had to change the art of Kempo a lot. Not a little bit, but a lot. You had to open your mind and, and open your spirit to be able to receive this information and actually to be able to do something with it. <clears throat> so in doing that, we became sort of this weird group of Kempo guys that went in a crazy direction. And the crazy thing to me is nobody else did it. So I'm sitting there wondering why no one else took the Ed Parker famous quotes and took them seriously and went forward with evolving and changing the art. Now, the truth is it took us well over 10 years to develop the art to be able to be used on the ground and to be used effectively. So this was no day at the beach. <laughs> this was many, many years of a lot of hard work. And many of my students who already were wrestlers and grapplers and jujitsu guys, um, they embraced it. I had to learn it. And then we worked together as a team to create the solutions for how to do your Kempo on your back. Then as the years went on, now that was 2005 when we switched over to Kempo 5.0. And we've continued to evolve since then. And in that journey, many other Kempo guys who left Kempo because there was no ground system who went into jujitsu have left there and come back to Kempo because of what we've done. Because they understood and they knew that if you guys don't change and evolve, you're going to be sitting on the couch eating potato chips talking about the old days. And we decided not to do that. So as those other 
Kempo guys came back to Kempo. And as our, our group continued to evolve, we in turn evolved the art of Kempo 5.0 again. So technically we teach Kempo 5.0.2. And for people that are like watching, listening, and are interested in Campo, what would you say would be like a valuable lesson or like what can students take away from studying Campo? Uh, well, what I hope, you, you know, now there are huge differences in different types of Campo. There always were differences, of course, but now they're, they're gigantic. So, the one thing I would love for people to get from Kempo in general is to switch how they think, change and think about science and physics and logic and application, real street application. And the second thing is don't be afraid to evolve and to change and to question authority as long as you do it respectfully. And, and, um, and that natural evolution of where we were and where we are now is exactly what Kempo Karate is supposed to be. One of the most famous quotes from Ed Parker is, when I'm gone, I hope no one traditionalizes my art. Well, <laughs> almost everyone did, um, it, which is kind of nutty to me, but that's their choice. Um, when we first changed over in 2005, as you can imagine, I took a lot of heat from everybody around the world. But I just kept saying, we got to figure this out, guys. We have got to do this. Otherwise, Kempo is just going to drop like a rock and everybody else is going to be doing great. And we're going to be sitting there holding the bag. So we decided to go it on a, alone. And then in a fairly short time, a few years, we finally started getting the respect from the rest of the Kempo community and the rest of the martial art community. And it's been a, a, a meteoric rise up ever since then. That's amazing, isn't it? The way you could have it is. You could have let the martial arts sink like a rock or throw that raft out and save it. And yes. Look at it now, you've evolved it and if I'm correct, it's your schools around the world and especially the one in Vegas are very popular and yes. I'm safe to say that you would not be like what would you call it? You wouldn't have um, practitioners sort of being like, ah, oh, no, we're going to drop out here. I say your numbers are ever increasing. Yes, we are. We've been on a, a steady trajectory upward for ever since we started it. I actually was prepared back in 2005. I figured, well, <clears throat> I'm going to lose at least 20% of my student base just because they won't want to change for whatever reason. And the, the opposite of that happened. Everybody stayed. Everybody was supportive. Everybody was thrilled. And then we've just grown from there. Because, And I think the reason why is because it's so incredibly obvious that we need to adapt and change and grow or else we're going to become obsolete, as Ed Parker pointed out. You know, the, uh, another famous quote from him, which fits right here quite well, is the ignorant refuse to study and the intelligent never stop. A real martial artist pursues change. He's not afraid of it. So, I, you know, I agree with that completely. And that's all we did was continue to evolve and change and grow. And where a lot of, look at it this way. Let's say a 17-year-old kid goes into a Kempo Karate school and goes, wow, this stuff is great. How do you guys fight in the ground? And they go, well, we don't do that. And they'll say, okay, thank you. Goodbye. You know, yeah. they're, they're, if you're not fighting on the ground, they're not going to stay there. So now the discussion we can have is whether you think our groundwork in Kempo is any good or not or any of that. That's great. We can have that conversation. The one that we just can't have is whether we should or should not be fighting on the ground. The answer is yes, we absolutely need to be doing that. And I hope other people follow suit. Of course, they're welcome to come over and join us if they wish, but a lot of people just can't bring themselves to do that for whatever reason, once again, is beyond my intellect. But but I do hope that the rest of the Kempo world does jump on and and continue to do the, the mandate from Ed Parker to evolve and change and grow. And you've been doing Kempo for many, many years. Can you share any memorable experiences or moments from either 
teaching or training that had like a lasting impact on you? Oh man, that's that's a long list. Uh, the answer is yes. This is my forty fifth year of tempo. Um, so, you know, the best day you, you can probably imagine what it was like being on the movie set of The Perfect Weapon. Ed Parker was alive. He was with me every day and night when we were doing fight scenes. It'd be three, four, five o'clock in the morning. He'd be right there at my side. We became very, very close. I choreographed, or he and I both choreographed the fight scenes for the movies. So what I would do is I would take my paper, pad of paper, and go over to his house and just sketch and make notes. And as the script was written and developed, I would say, okay, here's the environment. It's an apartment or it's a gym or it's a street or it's a whatever. And what would you like in the environment so that we could use to show our tempo? So we were actually in control of all of that. And then I got final edit and sound check from Paramount. Now, if you think about that, that's nuts because not only do they not give that to any actor, this was my first movie. So the, the fact that a company as big as Paramount would surrender that right to me was completely unheard of. But the, let's be clear, the reason they did that is because they knew I'm really the only one that knew what this stuff was supposed to look like. So when I first saw the edited fight scenes of the movie, I contacted the producer. I said, why is this here? This doesn't belong there. This should go here and that goes next and blah, blah, blah. And that's when he turned and said, okay, then why don't you come in and do it? And I said, great. I'd never <laughs> been in an editing bay before, nothing. So I walked in and sat down. And, and the end result is because of the work I did, the fight scenes were elongated. They were, they were longer because I knew this goes there, that goes here. And so that's important because the most expensive thing you're doing in one of these movies are the fight scenes. They take forever to shoot for seconds on film right? Yeah. 20 seconds on film could be a 12 hour day. Easy. So when you think about the expense of it, then, um, then you go, okay, if I can get three more seconds on film of a fight scene, that's money back on the screen for me. So, um, so it worked, you know, I made them more money by putting that, that stuff back up on the screen. And for us, I was able to tell the story of Kempo. This is who we are and this is what we do. Well, you've kind of led me on to the perfect weapon. You made that yes. transition awesome. So it's considered like one of your most iconic films. Um, what initially attracted you to the script and character? Yes. <clears throat> the There were many amazing things at during that time in my life. So I had been studying acting for five years previously to that, got little jobs as an actor here and there. I never told anybody I knew martial arts because I didn't want to wind up doing just a schlock martial art movie like so many others. I wanted what I wanted. And so I knew if I ever got my chance to do an audition or a screen test or something for a studio, I'd better be ready. Because even if you get your break and you're not ready, you're not going anywhere. So I studied acting five years so that if I ever got my break, I'd be able, be able to deliver. So that that's what happened. The producer I signed with, I got to him because in the acting workshop that I was a part of in Los Angeles, the guy that worked there teaching acting, ironically, was the guy that wrote Van Damme's second movie, Kickboxer. And we kind of became friends. And I said, you know, we'd been friends for months. And then I found out he wrote Kickboxer. I said, wow, that's amazing. I actually do this thing called Kempo. And he was, oh, that's amazing. So he came down to watch one night. And after that, that was it. He went back to the producer of Van Damme's first three movies, Mark DeSalle. And he said, I got the next one. You've got to see this Kempo stuff. You won't believe it. And it took him several times but he finally got him to come down to the karate school and and for us to do a demo and after that he was like okay he signed me for four pictures right there and then he was the one that got it into paramount so when paramount took the speakman deal it came with this producer the four of us were tied on all four movies 
The first one was called The Perfect Weapon. They wrote it for me. So I was able to interact with the writer during it. So all that stuff you see in the movie, in the dojo, all of those things, that, that's all stuff I contributed. The Tiger and the Dragon and all of that, those were my contributions. I didn't write any of it, but I worked with the writer on a regular basis. And then when it came to the fight scenes, we they were able to give us complete control of that which I'm not even sure today how that happened, but it did happen. <clears throat> and then that was the beginning. And um, the, the problem, and then you would think, okay, Paramount did the perfect weapon, the first of four movies. What the heck happened to the other three? And uh, that's a sad story because they had such a problematic time working with the producer that I was tied to. They never wanted to do another movie with him. Oh, gotcha. So that meant they they were just going to put me on a shelf and let my time elapse. And then it was over. And then that's exactly what happened. Now, I had an option with him. He had an option with me to do those three movies outside of Paramount if they didn't take the next movies, which they didn't. So now I'm legally tied to him. And that's how I got some of the other movies done. But as I'm sure you noticed, as everybody else did, the quality of the movies was nowhere near Perfect Weapon. That's why that's the one that stands out. We had all the money you would want. When you're working for a studio, it's a radically different experience than when you're working for an independent film company. So when you have all that money, it buys you time cameras, crew, lighting, all the stuff that comes with the money. So that's why the fight scenes in Perfect Weapon, Weapon really stand out. Um, but then you didn't really phone in the rest of your performances, so... I still... <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. You can't be accused of that. Yeah, no. And the truth is, every time... Now, even though the budgets for the rest of the movies were approximately one-third of the budgets we had for Perfect Weapon. Uh, when it was time to show up for work, I showed up for work. You know, there, I didn't pull back, hold back. Yeah, so we were limited. We didn't have three days to shoot a fight scene. We had one day. Okay, so we got to work harder. We got to be smarter. And you still have to deliver because nobody is going to look at the next movie and go, Ah, well, you know, okay, it was only one third the budget, so let's forgive this and forgive that. They're not going to do that. So you still have to deliver. You have to perform. But Perfect Weapon was magic. There, there was nothing. You, you can just imagine what it was like. You know, the first movie, the biggest production company in the world at that time, and I think still is today. You know, they had a billion dollars in cash in the bank in 1995. I mean, that's an insane amount of money. Yeah, And so you're working with the A-Team. And actually, Paramount is the only studio that has worldwide distribution. All the other studios, they sell Germany, they sell Italy, they sell to other distribution companies. Not Paramount. They distribute worldwide. That's why everywhere in the world you go, the name of the movie is the perfect weapon. When you look at other movies, it could be named something in the United States, something different in Germany, something different in Australia. But you don't when you work with Paramount because they're the only company that owns their own company all around the world. So it was it was an amazing time, you know. And then, as I'm sure you know, Mr. Parker died right after we were done filming Perfect Weapon. So he never got to see the movie. We finished filming at the end of November. He uh, was going back to Hawaii to see his 94 year old mother. And as soon as he landed on Hawaiian soil at the airport, he dropped out of a heart attack at age 59. Jesus. 59. It was so shocking and so tragic. And just think, you know, he the one thing that he wanted to do in his life that he never accomplished was to take his art to the world through film. That was the only thing. And here it is. And now it all got done exactly the way he wanted it from the biggest production company in the world. And then he just left us like that. And that was, that's the reason why I have not watched The Perfect Weapon since it was released in um, March of 91. 
I, I just can't watch it. It's just too, it's like, that's the past. I've got to get that out of my life because the, the painfulness of losing somebody I was that close to, that was so much a part of everything is just too much to, to deal with. So like your most iconic film, um, you really just can't go back and watch just because of the stigma around it, so to speak. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's quite accurate. Yeah. Okay, it's the um it's a it's a weird combination of emotion. Yes, it, it's very based in emotion. But it also is a little bit of you know, that's that's the past now. Yeah. Because he's gone. So let's let it be the past. You know, let's move on. We have to continue to live our lives. We have to do whatever it is that's coming next. So it it was a bit more than just emotion. It was like I have to put that behind me and I have to try to move on. And uh, if I'm always looking over my shoulder, I'm not going to be able to move forward. I've always wondered, you know, in The Perfect Weapon, when your character is about to get robbed and he has to hand over his wallet. Yeah, right. Does that work in real life? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you a funny story about that particular scene. We call it the wallet scene. So when you're done filming a movie you're done. If you're going to go back after you're done filming and film more footage, that's very expensive. No, almost nobody does that because it's so expensive. You got to hire the same crew, the same everything and get back on the horse and ride it again. But Paramount wanted to do that. And it's because all of the other fight scenes in the movie were edited sort of very choppy like There were many, many edits in one fight scene. And that's because uh, DeSalle, Mark DeSalle, his three previous movies were with Jean-Claude Van Damme. So, I mean, he's extremely limited in his martial art abilities. He's a very talented, incredible athlete, but he doesn't have much depth or much range in his martial arts skill. A jump spinning kick, a reverse kick, a, you know... So what you wind up doing is you shoot that one move five different times and then you edit it five different ways to try to elongate the fight scene. Well, it's the opposite in Kempo. There's way too much material. There's like an embarrassment of riches here. So when DeSalle was done with the movie and turned it into Paramount, they wanted one fight scene that didn't have so many edits in it. So instead of re-editing it, they said, let's shoot another fight scene. So they created the alley scene, wallet scene in the alley. And DeSalle was nowhere around. We shot it ourselves. I edited it myself. And what's it's so interesting you brought that up because what I have learned over the years is martial artists like that scene in the movie the best, as opposed to the scene that's in the Taekwondo gym, which is the big set piece fight scene, right? It's this huge thing. That took us three days, by the way to film that three 12 hour days to film that one fight scene and think that lasts, what does it last two minutes? And it took three days, three 12 hour days. It's crazy. So, but the other one we just shot in like half a day. So when you just talk to the public, they usually like that Taekwondo fight scene the best in the gym. But when you talk to martial artists, they like the wallet fight scene because it was more realistic. You know, it's just real quick, one hit, two, turn around, turn, bam, and it was done. And that's going to be a much more realistic portrayal of what happens in the street. You're not going to have this long pro- project. You kick somebody in the head and they turn around, they come back and again, kick him in the head and they come back. They're not <laughs> going to come back. So, uh, but but that was a real interesting, it was shocking for me when I got the call from Paramount that they wanted to add a fight scene. I mean, I would never have thought that because nobody does that. But but it's so funny that you brought up that particular scene. It would, I was going to say, it would be one of my favorite scenes from the movie. It's just short and sweet, but it's so yep. brutal at the same time. You're like, oh, shit, would that work? Would that work? Yeah, yeah. Tempo like, is an extremely practical street art. And it lost that standing after the Gracie family came here in 1991, 
and brought their type of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which morphed into the thing we have that's called MMA today. And if if you don't know how to fight on the ground, it doesn't matter how good you are stand-up fighter. Because the one thing that all those MMA jiu-jitsu guys know is eventually they'll get you on the ground. And once they get you down there, if you don't know what you're doing, it's over. So you'd better know what you're doing once you get down there. Now, a lot of Kempo guys who don't do what we did, they say, oh, they would never get me to the ground. I poke him in the eye, but, you know, okay, maybe, probably not. But that's the wrong conversation. The conversation you want to have is if we go to the ground, am I prepared? Yeah. And if the answer is no, then you'd better get ready. You've got to assume that you're going to the ground, especially this is 2023. How many people know jujitsu and MMA today? Definitely. It's an enormous amount. And if you're not ready for it, you're not going to have a good day. <clears throat> so the perfect weapon has gained a strong cult following over its years. What do you think con contributed to its popularity? Well, I think that it was how unique Kempo Karate is. It was sort of shocking for a lot of people to see this particular art. I mean, the only other time you saw something like this is when Bruce Lee did his films. And as you know, Ed Parker was Bruce Lee's American teacher. And a lot of what Bruce was doing in those years was Kempo. <laughs> so... But he was a much smaller guy than I am. You know, I'm six foot and 250 now. I was 215 when we did Perfect Weapon. And so to have a, somebody bigger moving like a smaller guy, I think that has a pretty interesting effect on film. Uh, but I, I really think it was the uniqueness of the art of Kempo. When you see it move, it's a very exciting and it's a very practical and as you pointed out, it's very brutal. It it really is. Um, but it um, I think that's what. And, and if you're a movie person, if you love movies, the fact that Paramount would do a martial art movie, they don't do those movies. When this first came out and was first announced that Paramount Pictures is doing a karate movie, nobody believed it. It was it was ridiculous. And so um, when it came out, of course, it got a lot of attention just because it was Paramount doing it. Um, but I, th I really think it was the explosive nature of the of the art of Kempo that made it so successful. And then people as well often forget that your career, as we mentioned earlier, did go on. You went on to star in maybe about six or seven other movies, headlining. Mm -hmm. Um. One of them that I found quite fun was Street Night. Um, what attracted you to the script of Street Night? Uh, Street Night was the second movie after Perfect Weapon. And that was part of fulfilling my legal obligation to the producer that took me into Paramount in the first place. So as I mentioned earlier, remember, there were four movies. Yeah. Paramount took all four. They only made one which left the other three on the table. So because I was legally tied to that producer, he had the right to go on and make the next series of Speakman movies. Uh, and I was legally bound to, to do those films. So Perfect Weapon was written for me and I participated in it, as I mentioned to you. And that was not the case in the other movies. So those movies were acquired for me, true, and rewritten for me. Yes, that's true. But I was not in the creative process of those other films. So that that movie, Street Night, was um, completing or, or moving forward with completing my contractual obligation to do those next three movies. Did you still have a hand in choreographing the fight scenes? Yes, in, in every movie, so I've started in 10, and in Perfect Weapon, of course, being the first one. 
So starting with Perfect Weapon and moving through on all nine other films, I had in my contract the legal right to have final edit and final sound check on all of the fight scenes, as well as choreograph them, of course. But I mean, it's one thing to choreograph the fight scene. It's another thing to go in and edit them. Yeah. So, for example, the legal language I had to have on my contracts was that I could go in and have control of the editing of the fight scenes as long as it did not interfere with the delivery schedule of the film. So as long as I could fit their schedule, they were fine with letting me do that. So for all the movies I've done, I've, I've actually had the opportunity to not only choreograph, but actually edit and have final edit and final sound check on all of them. That's actually amazing, isn't it? Because you don't really know it, too many people that get that opportunity. You bet. You, you, it is, it's nothing short of amazing. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. After my third movie, I think, came out, Warner Brothers approached me about doing a television series. So we went through all of that. Uh, they put me on what they call the holding deal. So they're going to hold you for a year while they develop your your TV series or movie or whatever it is. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's a paid position. They're going to pay you for a year because they're hold you. You cannot go do a TV series someplace else. So if they're going to keep you from doing that, they, they got to pay you to do that. And that's what we did. So we got moving on that, signed the initial contract. As we went forward, I went to Warner Brothers and I said, okay, you know I need to have the final edit and final sound check of all the fight scenes. I edit the fight scenes. And they said, we don't do that. Actors don't do that anywhere on movies or TV and Warner Brothers. And I said, okay, got it. Here's a crazy idea. Give me another title. So you can have me as an actor and have me as a associate producer. I don't care whatever it is. You don't have to pay me. I don't want any bigger percentage of the movie, but I want control of the fight scenes. As long as I can develop, as long as I can deliver on your schedule. I understand that's how the world works. And they said, no, we're not going to give you the right to do that. And I said, okay. I'm not doing the television series then. <laughs> you either give me that right with the limitation that it has to fit your schedule or I'm not going to approve anything because I am not going to take the art that I'm responsible for, the integrity of the art that I'm responsible and turn it into the hands of somebody who knows nothing about the art. Yeah, They might be great editors, they might even be great at editing action and fight scenes and car chases. That that could be very well true. But unless I sign off on it, then it doesn't represent Kempo. And that's my job. And they didn't get that. They said, we don't care. And I said, okay, then I don't care. So that's why the TV series never moved forward with Warner Brothers. <laughs> Excuse me. Do you know what the TV series would have been about? No, it really, it, what happened was my agents told me that they were having conversations with the producers of Chuck Norris's TV series, Walker, Texas Ranger, that I would come in and do a guest, a guest role on like eight or nine episodes. <clears throat> so then in the, in the industry, in the business, that word gets out, especially if you're, you have the biggest agent or the biggest attorney or the, you know, they are, that's a very, very, very small group of people. And so the word got out and that's in theory, why Warner brothers came to me. Anyhow, as they said, he's thinking of doing TV series stuff. That's what we hear. So maybe we want to do that with Warner brothers. So that probably was their motivation for starting it in the first place. Um, back to Street Night quickly. Um, it was a completely different take than your role in The Perfect Weapon. The Perfect Weapon was a very good martial arts movie, but Street Night was slightly grittier, more urban. <clears throat> and did you find that sort of... Um, a bit challenging being your second movie, having to go that step grittier? Um, 
yes, it, it definitely was more challenging, but it was part of the calculus at that time. So the way the people that were on my team then, they wanted to move me more into mainstream movies that did martial arts as opposed to martial art movies. They wanted me to, because they felt I could cross over. And in fact, one of the films we did was for Universal, um, which was called Escape from Atlantis. So that was really a sci-fi movie. And if you watch it, there's very little martial arts in it. So that in and of itself was a breakout for me because I was now the star of, a, although a different studio, still the star of a studio movie. And it was really about me being the lead of a movie that had martial arts in it, as opposed to coming into a martial art movie. Yeah. So that was an enormous success for me and for my career and for the statement we were trying to make, which is he can be a movie star independent of the karate. Now you lay the karate on top of the movie star thing. And, you know, we got Arnold Schwarzenegger meeting Bruce Lee. You know, there's a whole a whole lane for me to be in to continue to make movies. So that was the that was the thinking back then. And as an actor and martial artist, how do you approach um portraying like um the physicality and like authenticity of like a fight scene while also maintaining the safety of everyone around you, but then also making it look realistic? Because I'm sure back then compared to now everything was different when it came to filming a fight scene everything everything was different yeah it's the the thing you just described is really threading the eye of the needle because i'm moving way too fast if i hit somebody it would be really dangerous if i hit him in the wrong place like in the face and the nose and the neck in the knee and the whatever you can make some contact in the body and under the clothing they have pads and things um so you can make some pretty good pretty solid contact there and the reverse too you know i got knocked around quite a bit doing my fight scenes but um as long as you're careful and that you're accurate you can move what we would call street speed full speed and as long as they react at the right time of the intended hit it will and then you put a sound effect in and it looks like you're hitting when you're really not but um another sidebar interesting movie thing there was the stunt coordinator and second unit director of all of my movies is a guy named rick avery who's one of the biggest stunt coordinators in the history of the movie business who happens to be a seventh degree black belt in kempo and he was very close to Mr. Parker. So it was really great because he knew what I was going to be doing. So he would knew, know what stuntmen to bring in to do this technique or that technique. And so it was amazing to be able to work with the guy running the stunt crew who happens to be a Kempo guy. So that made it so much easier. Um, but in the movie business, it's very, very... I mean, you just never, not only from one movie to the next is it different, but in the same movie. Uh, I did one of my films called The Expert, and two-thirds of the way through that movie, the director got fired. Now, you fire a director in the middle of filming a movie, that's a big deal because there's not only all the reasons you can see that you fired him, but after he's gone, there's all these other things that come up that you didn't see, which would have been why you fired a man, you know, again. So when you fire a director and the new director steps in, then every day it's another problem that nobody saw coming. And you learn very quickly what it's like to salt, to create solutions on the fly. You're walking around with some guy with a camera on him going, okay, what are we going to shoot next? I mean, that's ridiculous, right? You don't even have a script you're working from. You got the writer, the producer, the cameraman, the director, the actors, they're all there. And everybody gets around in a corner and says, okay, here's what we got to get out of the scene, guys. What do you think? And everybody 
they write things down real quick and they move the camera here and there. Okay, let's shoot it. It's complete chaos. But we did it. And actually, I actually thought when the expert was over that that would be the end of my career. I, I thought that was it because there was no way you could live through that kind of chaos and actually get a movie with like a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, if you really reduce it down to its basic things. But, you know, when it was done and they put the music to it and the sound effects and all that, it actually turned out to be a pretty good movie. I was, was quite it proud of, of your it. contracted movies. It was. Yes. And, and let's be clear about what that means. You don't do it. You get sued for a lot of money. You sign a three picture, four picture deal. If you can, when you sign the deal, you want to be able to approve the movie, wouldn't you? You know, yeah. to, and but when you have no credits, when you have no accomplishments to speak of, you have no authority, no power to negotiate that. Here's the deal. You sign it or we'll get somebody else. It's just that simple. So, of course, you sign it, hoping for the best, you know. But then when they hand you the script and they say, okay, here's your next movie. Okay, you can say, I don't like this. I like that. Let's change. You can get some things done. But you're doing that movie. Even if you don't want to do it, you're doing it. Because if you don't, you're going to get sued. And you not only will you never work again, but any money that you made off all the other movies is going to go away. Yeah. They're, they're going to, there's just no, it's, you don't even consider doing it. Uh, you just you're there. Yeah. You, they hand it to you and you go, okay, I'm going to do the best I can. And some of the other movies were nowhere near as good as perfect weapon. Some of them were, but you don't have any say in that. You got to roll the dice and do the best you can and live with the consequences. And the expert had you working with James Brolin. What was it like working alongside him? He was, as with um, some of the, the Land of the Free, is another movie I did with William Shatner. And my experience with both James Brolin and William Shatner was, you know, these are big actors, big names, loads of experience, decades of work. And they were the most kind and professional and willing, hardworking. They were not the kind of guys that were really difficult or would go sit in their trailer and pout and complain and bitch and moan. They were not that at all. They were very, very nice, very professional people. And I learned a lot from both of them. So would you say out of your four picture deal, well, we've covered <clears throat> the perfect weapon, Straight Night and the Expert. Would the fourth be Deadly Takeover? Yes. Yep, that's right. That was the fourth one. And we shot that in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. So I was in Israel for about three months. And it was an amazing experience. Never been there before. So, um, and then part of my deal for that film was on the way back, they paid for uh, me to have a trip to egypt so i got to go and see the pyramids and all of that stuff so those are the cool things you know those are the things where you get to go to different parts of the world that you've never been to on somebody else's dime you know that they're paying you to go there and um and get to experience all of that and it was a wonderful experience i went to the dead sea every weekend and um i just i just really enjoyed it you know, just looking at human history from back in those days, you're walking on the very same walkways, pathways uh, that uh, Jesus walked on when he was crucified. I mean, it was so powerful to be there. And uh, I am a person who loves history. I love human history, what we've done, good and bad, to ourselves on the planet. So every time I would go there or to Greece or other places, famous places around the Mediterranean. I always got a thrill out of that. And what was it like shooting Deadly Takeover? Because <clears throat> if you were to watch it now, you would almost compare it to, it's like Jeff Spickman's mini Die Hard movie. Yeah, right. That's exactly what it was, <laughs> what it was uh, a takeoff of. Yeah, that's right. 
Um, it was, you know, it was wonderful. Uh, I have many of the films. So, so out of the 10 films that I did, probably two of them were fun. The rest of them were no fun. They were very difficult, especially Perfect Weapon, as great as that was. And that was the first one. And that was the beginning. And we had all that money and it was paramount. All those things are great. There was still so much turmoil in that production, which is why Paramount wasn't getting along with the producer and they were fighting back and forth. They're on the set every day and there's this and that going on, just disrupting the entire process. And just because people don't want to work with each other, you got to relax. You want to do a movie? Well, you'd better get ready to cooperate and you would better be ready to compromise because that's what movie making is. There's 20 people on there. They're the heads of their departments and they all have a voice and you want to have a successful movie. You'd better shut up and listen when it's time to shut up and listen and get along with everybody and work for a common goal. I learned a lot about that when I was doing movies and I have brought that experience forward into my martial art group, which I've mentioned is you know, as big as we are around the world, because I really learned those skills of how to work together and work to build a common goal of something. And that is exactly what we have accomplished in this Kempo 5.0 family. We call ourselves the 5 old family because after I went through stage four throat cancer in 2013, I came out of that, I lost 80 pounds that's eight zero. And um, I looked like I was about to die from cancer because I was. And uh, when I came out of that, we all collectively as a group knew that we could lose any one of us at any time. So instead of letting petty ego things get in the way, why don't we work together? Why don't we create something amazing, something you could really be proud of and that you help co-create i mean we're in 21 countries now and every single country leader feels and is a part of the process we went through to build what we have and this isn't me with all my students underneath me it's all of us together standing together to build something that we really believe in that's amazing um you caught me off guard there with uh cancer diagnosis um jesus how did you even cope with that like that must have been probably the hardest time in your life i'm well i'm guessing it was <clears throat> oh without a doubt <clears throat> it was um by the time i was diagnosed it had already gone to stage four and as you probably know stage five you're dead yeah <clears throat> so i had to go through the process as quickly as possible the uh, I went to a place called City of Hope in California, one of the top cancer hospitals in the world. And I started by going to the head of a robotic surgery. And she looked at me and said, if you choose surgery for this, you're going to have to sign a contract that would allow me to take your voice box if I thought it was necessary. Otherwise, we can't do the surgery. And I said, OK, what are the chances that you think? You're going to have to take my voice box, given what you have seen so far. And she said, that's very close to 100 percent. If, if we do this via surgery, you're going to lose your voice and you're going to have to speak through a synthesizer and all of that. Now, three days after that, I was meeting with the head of oncology, which is another world. She could only speak to me from a surgical point of view. And so. I don't know if you can imagine this, but imagine sitting in that doctor's office, having her look at through an endoscope. They put a tube down your nose and goes down the back of your throat. <clears throat> and right there, she turned to me and told me everything I just told you. And it's such a shock. You can't you can't imagine it. So. She said in three days, you're meeting with the head of oncology, they may have something different, but you need to understand that this is where you're at. And I immediately even said to her, if that is my choice, I'm just going to take my own life. I'm, I'm going to end my own life now. I'm not going to 
live out. I was 55 then. I'm 65 now. <clears throat> so I wasn't going to live the rest of my life without my voice. I mean, I, I don't get the point of that. So for three days, I was preparing myself to commit suicide. And I started making what they call the list. And that's the list of people you're going to call and you're going to thank them for being an important, positive place in your life and to say goodbye. Okay. And so I'm making the list. And three days later, I go see the head of oncology and he looks at me and goes, we got the cure for this. He said, we, we have an 85%. Now, he didn't say survival. He said cure rate. He said, we have an 85% cure rate. And these are including people in their 80s and 90s. You're 55. You're in the top 1% of physical health. You're going to make it and you're going to be fine. And so now drink that in for a minute. You got three days where you're preparing to take your own life. And then you go back and this guy says, don't worry, we got this. That emotional roller coaster is almost impossible <clears throat> to describe in any language. Words just come too, too shallow and too short to be able to share the depth of that emotional trauma, to be at the very low and then to be told you're going to be okay. I mean, he when he told me that, I just lost it. You know, I became so emotional. I just couldn't uh, withhold. I just began to weep because I was certain I was going to die. And then here's a guy who says, you're not going to die. It was so impactful. It still affects me here. Ten years later, I, I couldn't quite get through it. <clears throat> so it was very, very powerful. And so I elected to go through 34 days of radiation with eight sessions of chemotherapy simultaneous. So I was doing eight sessions with 34 sessions. So the day I did my chemo, I'd be at the hospital nine or 10 hours because chemo is a very slow drip in your veins. And so that was 34 days of radiation, five days a week. On the 32nd day, they, they make a mesh mask that they flip onto the table. So you're, you're held onto the table as it goes into the radiation machine. And on the 32nd day, <clears throat> the radiation poisoning was creating what would be effectively a sunburn. And you know when your skin peels off from a sunburn, but that's what was going on inside my throat. And so a flap of skin flipped over and, and covered my airway and I couldn't breathe. So I would exhale and kind of, it would blow it out of the way. But then when I would go to inhale, it would suck it back down again. Then I tried again and again. So each time I'm exhaling more than I'm inhaling. So I immediately called for help. They come running in. I'm now choking. I'm starting to, I think I'm going to die. The table comes out, then they have to unclip the mask because you're you're clipped to the okay. table. So they got that off. I rolled off the table. Now I'm face down and I'm gagging and I'm trying to breathe. And I finally got calmed down and I got my breath back and I made it. But I was very, very close to dying right then. And I was on my hands and knees, of course. And I turned and I saw the the feet of the people who had been giving me the treatment every day. And I looked up at them and I saw the look on their face. And that told me how close I was to being dead. It, it could have been any moment right then. So you recover and then they look at you and they go, we got to do it again. You've got to get back on the table and go back in the machine and finish. And I said, okay. So we got through that in the next two days, I got through that, but I was, you know, lost 80 pounds. I was emaciated. The last chemo session I had, it took them forever to be able to find the vein because I was so dehydrated. My veins had collapsed. 
uh, they it took quite a long time. They had to have three different people come in who who just did that. They were phlebotomists. That's all they do. And it took three different people to be able to find a vein. That's how that's uh, how collapsed my whole life, my body was. And then how long would that have put you out of the martial arts for as well? I'm sure you had to take a good hiatus. I did. <clears throat> the truth is, I was out for the first eight months of 2013. Then I started to get my strength back. They tell you it takes about two years to get your strength back. and But then to get back to who you really are, that takes about four years. It is very, very hard on your body and your mind. But I made it back. I started going back to the weight room again. And I had the strength of like a 12-year-old kid. You know, there was <laughs> no gas left in the tank. I was 80 pounds lighter. I had no strength. But I, I started and I fought my way back. And it was the overwhelming love and affection of my Kempo 5 family. They came to my side. People came from out of the country just to stand next to me. The, my husband wife team from Bolivia, they sold one of their cars to pay for the plane ticket to come and see me before I started my treatment. The rest of the martial art community, my fans, people all around the world, it was just a deluge of love and compassion, which gave me an enormous amount of strength because that's the moment. And, and I want everybody listening to reflect on this. That's the moment when you have to ask the most important question of your life, which is, did you matter? Did you make a difference? Did you do something in this life that was important and helped other people? If the answer to that in a very raw and honest moment is yes, then I was ready to leave. I was ready to take my own life because I really felt like the life I had led to then was a good life and that I had done everything I could to make the world a better place before I die. So if this was it, then I was ready to go for it. Now, when I recovered from that and got my bojo back, um, then it was, I was, I just had no fear. I had no fear anymore. I'm not afraid of success. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid of getting beat up. I'm not afraid of making money. I'm not afraid of losing money. It's a, just a different way of looking at the world. And after that moment of cancer in my life, that's when the 5 family really started to do great around the world. Because I, I decided to take the leadership position that I had some fear about. You know, some, some, um, I wasn't as confident but when I when I came out of cancer, I said, OK, that bullshit's over. We're, we're not doing that anymore. If you like me, great. If you don't, that's great. But here we go. And it's been that way ever since. So looking back on all the achievements throughout your film career. Controversial question. What would be your favorite movie and what would be your least favorite movie? Mm <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, you know, I have that uh, special place in my heart for The Perfect Weapon. Uh, I know that sounds bizarre because I just got through telling you I've never watched it <laughs> since it came out. <clears throat> but but now you know why. But, but um, it is a, such a special <clears throat> moment in my life um, that it just can't be compared to anything else. You know, I, when it, I have it sort of locked away in a special little compartment in my heart and I protect it and it's safe and secure there. And I feel great about it. It's a, a source of empowerment for me. I know how happy I made <clears throat> Ed Parker, my teacher. Uh, I know how much he wanted to do that. In fact, <clears throat> excuse me, several people who knew him for decades longer than I did all said pretty much the same thing, which is, the only time they have seen him as happy when we were doing the perfect weapon is when is during the birth of his five children. That's how happy he was that we were doing this. And when you throw on the layer of he went back to Hawaii, where he was from, to see his mother, 
And as soon as he stepped on Hawaiian soil, that was it. He, he died right there at the airport, actually. So there's an inference there that if he had done everything he wanted to do in his life, and these are big things, what he did, huge things. And the only thing left that he wanted was to do a movie the way he wanted it done with a big company. There it was. You're not going to get any better than Perfect Weapon. And it was almost like he went, okay, that was the last one. I got it. And now I'm moving on to whatever it is that's next. So, I mean, as tragic and sad and painful as all of that was, there's there's some something beautiful about it that that allows me at least to let that go you know when when you have the death of a loved one and we i loved him and he loved me and we knew it and we told each other that all the time it's same with lou angel the guy that taught me japanese goju he just transitioned to the other side a couple of years ago but when and and all my students around the world my my black belts who've been with me all this time they all know that i love them and I know that they love me because we tell each other. We're not afraid of that. And it's actually, you know, it started with karate, but it isn't that anymore. It's about the love and friendship and respect we have for one another. And then the karate is a distant second. You know, we're, we're pretty good at the Kempo that we do, but it's nowhere near as important as the love and friendship that we all share with one another. I was married four years ago. Oh, sorry, five years ago in in France, just outside of Paris in a place called Rhone, R-O-U-E-N, this gorgeous cathedral, one of the top 10 in all of Europe. And so my wife and I said, OK, what the heck, let's invite all the school owners from all 21 countries because they're family. Well, 80 people showed up from <laughs> all over the world. We had no idea. <clears throat> but But the point is, that's how close we are as a family, as a group. People came from New Zealand and Australia and of course all over Europe and from the United States and from Mexico and from everywhere just to be together to share this time and uh, you know of love and friendship. And that really is who and what we are. That's such an amazing bond to have, isn't it? Oh, it is so fulfilling. I you know tell them all the time, it, this is how I'm going to live out the rest of my life you know, in this world, this utopian society that we have co-created called the 5 family. I, I'm instrumental in it, but I didn't create it. We created it together. And this is, this is how I want to live. And it, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling that you have that much love. I mean, think about that. I mean, th many of these people, English isn't their first language. Yeah. And so many diverse cultures and differences and all that. It doesn't matter. We stripped away all of those walls of illusion that separate everybody else. Religion, government, race, sexual preference, sexual identity, age. None of those things matter. The only thing that really matters is the content of your character. And you show that every day with how you treat the other members of your 50 family. And we all know that and we get it. We're in this together. We've decided this is how we want to go through the rest of our life. And when it's time for me to transition to the other side, it of course is set up to go on without me after I'm dead. Now, whether it does or not, I don't know. That's up to them. You know, I won't be here anymore. So you guys want to screw this up, go ahead and do it. But <laughs> But until I die, we're going to do it exactly this way. And and it's going to be lead with love and friendship and the karate comes second. I have to ask, because I know there's some fans out there that would completely annihilate me for not asking the, this question. So, Well, then by all means. <laughs> what was it like working with, as the fans will know, Star Trek's favorite, but as I know him, Michael Myers is faced William Shatner. Yeah, he he was, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, a terrific person. And I had no idea what to expect. Um, and he showed up 
And uh, right from the beginning, okay, day one, they do a thing in the movie business called a read-through. All of the actors are sitting around a big table, and they all have their script. And there's the producer and the director and somebody keeping time and making notes. And you do a read-through. You're not acting. You're just reading everything through, more for timing. <clears throat> and that was the first day I met him. And from that day forward, he was a very gracious and kind you know, a guy of his stature could easily take his plate of lunch and have it delivered to him in his trailer. Most of them do. But he didn't do that. He sat out on the tables with all of us, with the stuntmen and the cameramen and the, and the other actors, just hanging out. And uh, when, when he wasn't acting in his scene, instead of staying in his trailer, he was out on the movie set with us, sitting there watching everybody do their thing, talking, being a good guy. And I was just blown away by, by what a good guy. Now, a few times, very few, in the years after that, I would be in L.A., Hollywood, and I'd go into a restaurant and he would be there, right? <laughs> and I would walk up to him and I'd say, hey, Bill, I'm not sure you remember me. I'm Jeff Speakman. We did a movie. He was like, oh, Jeff, my God, you know, stand up and hug me. And how have you been? And it's so good to see you. And, you know, you don't expect that, right? Yeah. Not from a guy like him. But he is as genuine and wonderful as a person you, you would ever meet. That's amazing, isn't it? You always think it people like that wouldn't be as humble. Exactly. But, but he is. And that makes it even more powerful. You know, we, we have got to learn that, you know, the money and the fame and all of that stuff isn't important. It isn't. The, you, we all have to have enough money to get by and get along and pay our bills. And yes, but when you start thinking that the money and the car you drive and the house you live in and the zip code you live in is important, that's when the problems come. It yeah. isn't important. It is not. It's great to have a nice car and live in a nice house, but that doesn't define who you are. What defines who you are is the, your heart and the depth of right. the emotion that you have that you can love other people and care about other people and have them care about you. I, I wish for everybody and including everybody who would be within earshot shot of this discussion that they could experience the kind of love I have with my wife, Kim. You know, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I have been able to experience that in this life. And I wish that for everybody else because that kind of love and commitment is the best of what it is to be human. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like having the love of your wife and your family, really, it's all you need. So yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. When you get it right, it's it's beautiful. <laughs> when, when you don't get it right, it ain't so hot. It costs you a fortune. Costs you a fortune, yes. I have my diploma to the human race, which is a divorce decree. <laughs> uh, I've been married, I've been, been there, done that. <laughs> so two more movies i want to ask you about um the first one being memorial day what attracted yes. you to it in memorial day is a really good example of what does attract me and i think a lot of actors to different work. it it does of course start with and end with the script and the story and how you feel about it when you read it but a lot of what else comes into play is who are you going to work with? You know, that matters so much. And the people who produced that movie were wonderful people. I had known them for many years. Uh, we were friends for sure. And so it was a pleasure to work with them. That's one of the examples of a movie where it was such a pleasure to work on. It was fun every day where I, where I had mentioned to you earlier Many, most of the movies are not fun to work on. <laughs> but, but when you, I love, love, love the movie business. I loved it. And I think everybody works in it, loves it too. When you're working and you're in the movie business, it is a phenomenal feeling to be a part of a team of people who work so hard, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, every day, five, six days a week, you really bond and you, you know, all of that stuff. When you are not working and you're looking for your next job, that's when it's miserable. 
because the nobody cares. There is no such thing as Hollywood loyalty. None of that. It's all about money. And it's, and it's what are you worth today? If Jeff Speakman's right for some guy's movie, but my name isn't worth that much money on the open market, though, they won't even call me because it's, it's about the money first. And you, so of the 10 movies I've started and I produced three of them. So I understand how the business works and I understand that's a part of it. It's an unfortunate part of it though, but it, it is what it is. I'm just working with a, a gentleman who directed two of my films. His name is Worth Keeter and he's actually writing a script for me, for us. Uh, we sat down and came up with this idea and interacted back and forth. So when he's done writing the script, we'll see maybe there'll be another movie in my future. Maybe not. I don't know. Possibly action, martial arts? Yes, 100% on both of those. It'll be a very, very different film. It's called Requiem for a Hitman. So I play the hitman, the, a very, very dark character who has redemption at the end of the film, of course. But it's uh, not being the hero. It's being the anti-hero. So I, I, uh, I think that would be very interesting. Definitely. And hopefully other people will think so too. And another film, final one, Run and Red. I found that to be such a fun action film. Um, I'm sure as that what just attracted you to it. It was just it was yes. your standard meat and potatoes action film, but it was fun. Yes. And and there's the other example of a great it was the people I was working with, you know, the producers and the directors and the team. It was so wonderful to be with the right people. You know, it really I'm not sure what other actors what experiences they have, but when you start with a movie as big as The Perfect Weapon and, and working for a company like Paramount. They have, you know, can, can you imagine that's your first movie? I mean, that's nuts, right? That just yeah. never happens. And then they give you things like control of the fight scenes and edit the fights. And all. You would never, never think that's never happened before and probably will never happen again. And, and even under those circumstances, because of the people I was working with, it was miserable. So then that's your first experience, right? Now yeah. what's your next experience and your next one and your next one. And so then finally, when you get to a movie, when you're working with other people who aren't like that, it's such a pleasure. The creative process, everybody sits around a table. What do, you, what do you think of this, Jeff? How would you say this? What do you think of your character? You know, we're thinking this, what do you think? And you're a part of developing something like that. That's that's a wonderful feeling. It's exactly what we did in our 5 family in our martial art world. Everybody's a part of everything that we're doing. They feel it. They know it. I support them. They support me. It's it's a it's a wonderful way to go through life. And if there are any people out there who are listening to this, who are curious, you can go to my website, jeffspeakman.com. You can look into where there are schools. We have an online academy. So if you want to join and just learn online to get started, you can do that if you wish. And But the reason why I would want you to go there is because you're looking for what I just described to you. If you're looking for that, it doesn't matter whether you're Kempo. I, I've had several Shotokan schools leave Shotokan and join us. And I know it's because of who we are, not because of what we do. And if there are people out there listening, then please go to the jeffspeakman.com website and have a look. And if you are that same kind of energy, then we are your cup of tea. Um, I have to say as well, Campo does, it does look appealing. I studied Chung De Kwan for a while hmm. and it was brilliant, but um <clears throat> birth of my son um sort of took me away from martial arts a bit um still mm. practice at the house but you know um everything just became more <clears> hands-on <throat> balancing home life work life and then yes family yes sir and yep now i've got three kids um wow two, 
tour in wow. jiu-jitsu and all right i've started studying chung to kwan again so hmm. we always come back good right? for you good for you yeah we have our uh, annual <clears throat> event in europe every november it's in etamp france just south of paris um if once again if you go to not only jeffspeakman.com but you, in europe we have jeffspeakmaneurope.com <clears throat> eu sorry <clears throat> and uh if if you want to just come visit us and see what we do it'll be november um 22 23 24 that weekend in etamp and uh, i have five schools in france and a dozen schools all throughout europe even in exeter england you know, down south where you are, a really wonderful school there. So uh, we're 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 all over the place. We've got 21 countries. So if you're interested, everyone is welcome. Also, I never forgot to ask. It was on my question list. Um, I remember ages ago. I want to say ages ago. I mean, ages ago. It was on Internet Movie Database. You were meant to be doing some sort of like expendables esque film yeah. there was meant to be two parts to it with like I think it was like right. Olivia Grunet, Don Wilson. Was that an actual project in the works? No. no. Um it was a project in conversation, but it never went forward after that. Um but Olivia Gruner who you mentioned, there is a very, very good guy who is an outrageously talented martial artist. That's a guy who I thought should go, should have gone much, much bigger as a star. Uh, but, and, and he's a good friend. So, um, yeah, but those are all good guys. I, I would love to work with them, but that never went anywhere. Um, what do you think of the action genre at the moment? Like you've got, for instance, you've got your big movies like, you know, John Wick, which is huge. But then you've got like your lower budget movies still, as we had in the eighties. But like everything now is very constricted. It's sort of like a movie to be shot in a week or two. Yes. Like, what's your take on that sort of aspect of the industry now? It's a radical, as it is in everything in life, but it is a radically different environment now. Technology has moved the movie business. Streaming has changed everything. And as you pointed out, you know, they're doing movies in two weeks that used to be eight weeks, you know. Yeah. And part of that is because the technology has made it so much easier. You can edit a full movie in your bedroom, you know, um, so you don't need an editing bay anymore. Everything is shot on digital. Um, so it's a different world, which will be challenging for us once the script is ready to make its rounds out there, the one I've told you about that we're doing, Requiem. Um, um, so there will be a lot of adapting to the, the new way things are, but you know, the, this is one of the axioms of our group, of our martial art group, which is embrace change to create the future or it will create you. So whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. So you might as well get on the right side of it and try to get something good out of it instead of just sitting back and complaining all the time, which there's a lot of that going on in my country these days. And finally, grand finale. Yes. And it's probably such a letdown of a question, but I've got to know, how many times have you been pitched a perfect weapon, the perfect weapon to Wow. Um, the people who spoke to me about that, there would be at least half a dozen times, six, eight times, different different groups. None of them were the people who could get that done. Yeah. So Paramount never came back to me because really, you know, the people who were in charge of production, the president of production, the president of whatever division, they're not there anymore. And the problem with that is if you go back and do something that was a success of the person before you, then that person gets the credit for it. Yeah. Which is why they're not going to do it. So, um, so the people who could 
get that done are are not going to do it because it's it's on the wrong side of the equation. Well, oh, I honestly thought it would have been so much more. I thought you would have been like every other month. I'm getting a script thrown at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Back then, I did get a lot more projects um, coming at me, obviously, for, for obvious reasons, because my name was worth money. Um, but the life that I live now is beyond phenomenal. I'm I'm so happy. I'm content. I live a wonderful life. I travel all over the world to get to see my 5 family all the time. And then every year, every July, we have everybody come from around the world here to Las Vegas where I live and we put on the biggest black belt test, the biggest tournament, the, all the seminars. It's a wonderful weekend of all these friends coming back together. <clears throat> it's uh, it's every July. In fact, it's on jeffspeaking.com. If anybody wants to go look, everybody's welcome. But um, you're, you're looking at and talking to a very happy person. I'm happy to still be alive and to be doing the stuff I love and to be surrounded by the people I love. And on that positive note, that's us. That's it. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I really want to take a minute and thank you um, for reaching out to me. I mean, we're halfway around the world from one another, and it just doesn't matter, does it? Definitely so not. so it's really great, and I, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to meet you and share some of these things with you and your fans. Likewise with yourself. Um, you're a legend in my eyes, and I'm just glad to have you on. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank Give you. a call back whenever you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. All the best, then. You too. Thank you. Right. Righto. Bye-bye.